Good morning, everyone, and thank you very much for joining us this morning for this edition of our Women with Heart online seminar series. Today's talk is entitled Menopause, a Critical Time to Take Stock and Optimize Heart Health. We're very excited. Our speaker today is Dr. Paula Harvey. Dr. Harvey is an Australian medical graduate. After completing her specialty training and subsequent PhD in 1999, she relocated to Canada as a National Health and Medical Research Council Scholar to complete postdoctoral training in cardiovascular physiology at the University of Toronto. In 2002, Dr. Harvey was appointed to faculty in the Division of Cardiology at the University Health Network. In 2010, Dr. Harvey joined Women's College Hospital as Director of Cardiovascular Research and subsequently also as Medical Director of the Women's Cardiovascular Health Initiative, the Women's College Hospital Cardiac Rehabilitation Program. In December 2013, Dr. Harvey was appointed Division Head of Cardiology at Women's College Hospital until April 2018. She, in, she assumed the role of Interim Physician-in-Chief of the Department of Medicine in July 2014. In March 2017, she was appointed Physician-in-Chief of the Department of Medicine at Women's College Hospital. In May 2017, Dr. Harvey was appointed the FM Hill Chair in Women's Academic Medicine. In January 2019, Dr. Harvey was appointed Interim Chief of Staff. Dr. Harvey's clinical and research focus is on cardiovascular disease in women across the lifespan, with a special interest in hypertension and atherosclerosis, cardiovascular disease prevention through lifestyle interventions such as exercise, and cardiovascular disease in women with multiple complex diseases. We're very, very lucky to have Dr. Harvey with us today. Thanks, Lisa. Uh, welcome, everybody. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, and thanks, uh, Lisa, for the introduction. I think the, the most important point is that I've spent a career working in women and heart disease. Um, we've come a long way, but we've still got a long way to go, and uh, Lisa and her team are doing a lot of work at the Research Institute, and we're doing a lot here, and there's a lot happening across the country. I am not a menopause specialist, and I'm not a gynecologist. Um, I'm in cardiology, so I put that caveat um, uh, out there just so that uh, people, you know, we have realistic expectations of uh, where I'm coming from today. So I do, though, want to talk about uh, first what we mean by menopause. I'm sure many who are listening are either in the process of transitioning through or are pa past the sort of transition into menopause. And people, we don't talk much about what we actually mean by menopause. Um, what are the implications for, um, of menopause for cardiovascular health? A little bit about what we know about hormone therapy and how that may fit into your cardiovascular health. And then um, the benefits of sustaining a healthy lifestyle and how that can help you with the menopausal transition, particularly from a cardiovascular point of view. So I think, you know, one of the things that we've really um, become aware of and that I've been focusing on amongst others in my career is that women are not just small men. We, we actually have a different biology to men, and part of that is related to the, what I refer to as the overlay of hormones um, and the effects of the hormones on our biology over what we call the reproductive life stages. And so that starts, you know, we go from childhood to adolescence and puberty. Um, you may go through conception, pregnancy, maybe on hormonal contraception, um, and then the, transition into the perimenopause, then the postmenopausal period. And, and the overlay of these hormones lead to different cardiovascular effects. Um, into that and overlaying that is also things like socio, social and cultural and ethnic differences. Um, and really a lot of the research into menopause has been done in Caucasian women, and we need to be doing more in women of different uh, ethnicities and cult social cultural backgrounds. So what do we mean by menopause? Um, majority of women are going to go through what's called a natural spontaneous menopause. And we mean that um, you go through a perimenopausal period where your periods start to become irregular, hormones start to go rather wonky. Um, you may start to get symptoms of menopause even while you're still having menstruation. And then once you've gone through and you've had 12 months 
straight, continuous, without any menstrual periods, that then means you're in menopause. So it's, it's, it's once you've reached that stage that we look back and say, okay, 12 months without periods, you're now in menopause. And it's important because it is preceded by that perimenopausal period, which is, is an important change in a woman's life. We start to see some of the changes where you're going from a premenopausal to a postmenopausal woman. And these include the irregular periods, um, changing fertility. So women are much less likely to be able to conceive when they're going into that perimenopause period, even though they're still having menstrual periods. And they start having menstrual symptoms like hot flushes and sweats. Um, the median age of menopause is 51 and a half years. Now, as I mentioned, most of this research is in Caucasians, and we know that that age could differ with different ethnicities. And what, we, what that means is that your ovaries stop producing the follicles that are responsible for being able to get pregnant, but also producing estrogen and progesterone. And because of that, your estrogen and progesterone levels become very low. And um, you may get a high um, follicle stimulating hormone, which is called FSH. And I've only mentioned that because sometimes this is done in blood tests when people are looking to confirm whether or not someone's either perimenopausal or, po or postmenopausal, because that FSH level goes up. Now, in spontaneous menopause, testosterone, which a lot of people don't realize we actually produce from the ovaries, that does continue, but we have low estrogen and progesterone. So spontaneous menopause is early 50s. We refer to early menopause as between the age of 40 and 45 years. And then there's a condition called premature menopause, which is when a woman goes through menopause at less than 40 years. And that's really what we call premature ovarian failure. Um, and then the final category I'd put here is surgical menopause. And this is when women have surgery to remove their ovaries and they just have a sudden, they don't go through that perimenopause, they suddenly lose their estrogen and progesterone and their testosterone, and they will be suddenly thrown into menopause. Now, these are particularly premature menopause and surgical menopause, because anything that I talk about with respect to uh, menopausal effects on health in women are going to happen generally earlier and for surgical menopause more suddenly in these women. So although this, uh, this slide looks a little bit complicated, I just included this to show you that um, women do go from this, as you see the terminology, their reproductive years, the menopausal transition, which is perimenopause, and then into postmenopause, where you're sort of early menopause and then late menopause. Um, the duration of that transition is variable across women. Um, and it's during that perimenopause that you'll start to, to recognize that you're heading into that, the, the next, what I refer to as the next half of your life, because we're going to spend many decades in the, peri, uh, in the postmenopausal period. And just to give you an example of what happens to your hormones, um, I just thought again, you know, it'd be good for you to see that when you're on the left, you'll see a graph that shows peaks and troughs of hormones. That's your estrogen and progesterone when you're perimenopausal. Um, so you start off low and you've had a period and then they go up and down as you ovulate. When you're postmenopausal, the levels are flat. So the symptoms of menopause, I don't really need to go into too much, too much detail here because the sort of hallmark symptom is hot flushes or flashes, depending on, I come from Australia, we call them hot flushes, they're flashes in North America. And then night sweats. Night sweats are, um, really hot flashes that occur during the night and wake people, wake women from sleep. And they're often associated with sweating, um, uh, insomnia, and a lot of anxiety. And in fact, hot flushes, although they occur during the day with a number of different precipitants, they're actually more frequent at night than during the day. Um, and with these hot flushes, women can get symptoms like um, palpitations, which can actually lead them to seek uh, medical advice because they may think there's something wrong with their heart. Uh, they can experience a number of other symptoms with in the perimenopause and in the postmenopausal period, like vaginal dryness, um, problems with bladder infections, sleep disturbance, disturbance. Uh, importantly that we'll touch on today because of the impacts cardiovascular health is new onset depression and anxiety. 
And of course, we also see an increased risk of osteoporosis with risks, risk of fractures and increased frailty. Um, and they're very closely linked to your estrogen levels. They, women can also get symptoms like joint pain and sort of complain a little bit about memory impairment. And we're not sure how closely that's associated with the hormones, but it, um, it is frequently recorded in that perimenopausal and postmenopausal period. And of course, today we'll focus on the increase, the effects on cardiovascular risk, which unfortunately increase as we go through the perimenopause to the menopause. So what do we know about uh, how menopause may affect cardiovascular health and risk of death from cardiovascular disease? This graph um, is, a, is taken from Statistics Canada, and you'll see on the bottom line, as you move to the right, um, different age groups, starting off at 35 to 44 and going up to the 85 plus age group. And on the y-axis or the vertical axis is the percent. And that's the percentage of total deaths from cardiovascular disease in women in pink versus men in blue. And what you see is in the first half of the graph, the women, so the pink bars are much lower than the blue bars, which means that women are protected from cardiovascular disease and death. And we call this the, the pre-menopausal advantage when it comes to cardiovascular health. Then as women go through menopause, those middle years, you'll see the sort of 55 to 64, as you grow into the next half of the graph, the 65 to 74 um, age group, the women are starting to catch up and then they overtake men. And so in that second half of our life, in the postmenopausal period, we lose that premenopausal advantage and we gradually increase our risk of cardiovascular disease and death. Why is that? Well, part of it is related to the hormones. It's probably, it's not all, but partly. So you have, I just thought I'd show a schema here. You have your reproductive um, life in the, the right box there that leads into perimenopause and down to menopause. Surgical removal of the ovaries goes into menopause. This causes estrogen deficiency and progesterone, but progesterone is less important for cardiovascular health. And this leads to a lot of different uh, effects on the cardiovascular system. I'm going to talk about the effects on blood pressure with increased hypertension, metabolic derangements. So we, uh, we do change, we increase weight, we, um, we also increase uh, the risk of diabetes. We become less efficient at dealing with blood sugar in the circulation. Uh, cholesterol changes for the worst, I'm afraid. Um, we have impairment of our sleep and mood, so depression, and these impact cardiovascular health. And then there's another uh, role here, and that's endothelial dysfunction. And I'm going to just touch on that in the next slide, just so you know what I mean. These all feel, uh, sort of flow into an impairment of cardiovascular health in that second half of our life where we're postmenopausal. So what we mean by endothelial dysfunction, we have a single layer of cells that line our, our arteries, our blood vessels, and they're called endothelial cells. And these cells are really imp important to the health of our blood vessels. If these cells start to have abnormal function, then we get inflammation of our blood vessels and we build up plaque and we're at increased risk of cardiovascular disease with heart attacks and strokes. And we, so this is endothelial dysfunction. And you'll see the risk factors up the top here um, that cause endothelial dysfunction. I'll put in red there, postmenopausal state, but a lot of these other risk factors actually are associated with that postmenopausal state. So endothelial dysfunction um, and how that impacts the health of our blood vessels is really important. And it's that increase, um, that impairment of endothelial function that leads to what you're seeing on this uh, cartoon here, where you go from a normal blood vessel on the left to gradual buildup of plaque and inflammatory cells, and then a blood clot that will cause a heart attack and stroke. So premenopausal women are protected from cardiovascular disease to a large extent. And in fact, the, the older you are when you have menopause is good for you from a cardiovascular perspective. So there's actually a 2% decrease in mortality from heart disease with every one year delay in time to onset of menopause. And that's why early and, and premature menopause are important when it comes to cardiovascular health. So the earlier you go through menopause, the more important these changes on the cardiovascular health are. 
So beyond endothelial dysfunction that I've touched on, what does menopause do to all the cardiovascular risk factors that you would hear about from the team at um, the Rehab Institute? What about smoking? Now we know smoking, everybody knows smoking is bad for cardiovascular health. Uh, the important thing with smoking is that it's actually one of the only risk factors that we've identified that's associated with earlier onset of menopause. The other risk factors are genetic, so what, what your mum has experienced, you may be more susceptible to from menopause onset and possibly high alcohol intake. So smokers on average have two years earlier onset of menopause than non-smokers. Um, now, what about blood pressure? Just like cardiovascular disease, women tend to be protected during the premenopausal period from high blood pressure. But unfortunately, as we go through menopause, the, um, our blood pressure increases and we actually end up having more high blood pressure or hypertension. Than men. And I know that uh, you have had a, a talk about hypertension in women, and it's a very important topic because it's a very important risk factor for heart disease and stroke. So this, these two graphs here just is showing you that um, men are on the left, women are on the right. You'll see that um, that top yellow line for men is pretty much a straight line as men age. For women, you'll see again, we start lower and then we go up steep. And that's our blood pressure as it starts to increase as we go through menopause. Um, the bottom line, that's the second component of blood pressure or diastolic blood pressure. That interestingly, in men and women, it starts to increase as we age and then it starts to decrease, but that's because our blood vessels become stiff and it's not actually a good thing. And women are much more, susceptible than men to the stiffening of their blood vessels. Um, so increased uh, rates of hypertension and blood vessel stiffness. So the effects of menopause on blood pressure. Postmenopausal women are twice as likely to have hypertension as premenopausal women. And in fact, when you were younger, you probably, a lot of women will say that they had low blood pressure. Um, I do run a hypertension clinic amongst other things. And a lot of women will come in in the, when they've gone through menopause and say they don't understand why have I got high blood pressure when I always have had low blood pressure. Unfortunately, that's because you've gone through from premenopause to postmenopause. Surgical menopause, where it happens like that, that's associated with a very rapid increase in blood pressure. As I mentioned, the elasticity of the blood vessels decreases quite rapidly in the postmenopausal period in women. We become more salt sensitive, so you've got to be more attentive to the salt in your, your food because it's going to push your blood pressure up much more than when you were younger in premenopause. And there's evidence of increasing the stress component of the central nervous system that pushes blood pressure up after menopause. And so if you look at the prevalence of hypertension, which is what this graph here shows, um, men are in the solid bars and women are in the uh, lighter bars with age again on, on the bottom. And you'll see that we go from women being very low risk of hypertension on the left there in the left bars. And then by the time you're up in the 65 to 74 uh, age range, we've overtaken men when it comes to hypertension. It's also important to note that it can be harder to control hypertension in women than in men because we have a slightly different pattern because of that stiffness of our blood vessels. What about cholesterol? So again, this is a bit of a, a re repetitive theme, but women tend to be protected against bad cholesterol in their premenopausal years. As we go through perimenopause into menopause, so you have an increase in your total cholesterol count, but also a rise in the bad cholesterol, which is called LDL, and a decrease in the good cholesterol, which is the HDL, the cholesterol that actually cleans up the blood vessels, that gets lower. Um, what about diabetes? <clears throat> diabetes is particularly bad in women and particularly interestingly in premenopausal women, if they have diabetes, they lose that, that premenopausal protection against cardiovascular disease. And we do know that when women go through menopause, they're at increased risk of developing diabetes for a number of different reasons. Um, part of it is the effects of losing the hormones on how, we, how sensitive we are to insulin and, and how we manage uh, sugar in the, the circulation. 
but there are other things like change in weight and uh, our physical activity levels. So what about overweight and obesity? Well, um, unfortunately, when we go through that menopausal transition, there's a change in the distribution of adipose tissue or fat tissue within the body. And what happens is instead of having that weight where we tend to carry it in our premenopausal years on our hips and our, our uh, buttocks, it tends to move into the central compartment, so into the waist area. And um, that's where, the problem with that is that that's where a lot of diabetes and high blood pressure sits, is in that fat tissue around the midline. Um, and we actually refer to that as central obesity, or it's like a male pattern of obesity, because you probably notice when men put on weight, they put it on their tummy much more than, some, than the rest of the body. We start to do that as we go through menopause. Then physical inactivity. Um, now we know that physical inactivity increases with age, that it's becoming a real problem in our society. A, lot of, a large percentage of our population is inactive. And for menopause, there's a number of things that may contribute to women becoming less active. Things like uh, some of the joint pains that women might get with menopause, the weight gain, uh, change in mood with depression, and change in, you know, insomnia. So we have to be very aware of the fact that we could end up looking a bit like this polar bear, which is just one of my favorite pictures as an Australian. I love this, this sedentary polar bear here. Depression. Now, depression um, is a significant risk factor for heart disease and death from heart disease. And depression affects women twice uh, as much as it affects men, even without menopause. Um, and we know that depression and new onset depression and anxiety increase in the uh, peri and early postmenopausal stage of life. So it's important to be aware of some of those mood changes. Fortunately, the, menopause, the later postmenopausal period, the depression tends to stabilize and perhaps go down a little bit, but that transitional period and early menopause are a problem. What about uh, sleep? So disorders of sleep increase um, with menopause, and that's important because disordered sleep leads to hypertension, diabetes and increased risk of heart failure. So problems with sleep in menopause can be um, due to the hot flashes that I've mentioned, the night sweats that wake people up. And women, some women that get a lot of night sweats can spend a lot of the time waking up repeatedly because of these uh, episodes. Even in the absence of hot flushes, we know that um, during the menopausal transition, up to 40% of women will have sleep disturbance. And that gets even uh, up to 46% later in that transi transition when women get into menopause. Um, and that can contribute. We know depression and anxiety can, can affect your sleep. Importantly also, obstructive sleep apnea, which is a risk factor for high blood pressure and heart failure. We're protected in our premenopausal period from sleep apnea. Again, a recurring theme. We go through menopause and we start to see increasing rates of sleep apnea in postmenopausal women. Okay, so um, if we have all of these effects on the cardiovascular system, and we think a lot of it is coming from loss of estrogen, and maybe a little bit of effect from the progesterone, why don't we prescribe a lot of estrogen or hormone therapy to women in their postmenopausal period? Well, it's complicated. And the history of hormone therapy is quite checkered. So when I started this work um, back in the 1990s, we were being told that all women should be on hormone therapy or HRT as it was known then, hormone replacement therapy for their cardiovascular health and their bone health. However, in the early 2000s, the pendulum swung and we were being told that women should not be on HRT. Now we're in the 2020s and we know it's very complicated and it definitely depends. So what do we mean by hormone replacement therapy? or HT, hormone therapy. These are different types and doses of estrogen and progesterone. And they can be given so that they have systemic effects, 
so affect all the different organs in the body, or they can be um, given locally into the uh, transvaginally, so into the vagina, um, for just local effects. And so I'm just, for the transvaginal estrogen, that's for vaginal dryness and urogenital symptoms, meaning uh, frequency of urinary tract infections, et cetera. This is not absorbed into the system. Um, and really there's very few contraindications to transvaginal estrogen. The main one being hormone receptive positive breast cancer. And if you've had a history of uterine cancer, and I'm not gonna talk about that more today because it's a very local use of estrogen. It's not having systemic effects. If you're looking at systemic estrogen, that can be given as oral tablets or capsules. It can be a patch on the skin. It can be cream on the skin, gel on the, the skin. And there are uh, other ways of giving it with vaginal rings and a spray. Now, when you give systemic estrogen, women also have to take a progesterone if they have not had a hysterectomy. So if you still have your uterus, you have to take a progesterone because if you take estrogen on its own, it causes the lining of the uterus to reproduce and build up, and that's called hyperplasia. And over the years, that can lead to increased risk of cancer of the uterus. So systemic hormone therapy in most women means estrogen and progesterone. And the progesterone can be given every day with the estrogen, or it can be given what we call cyclically, where it mimics the menstrual cycle. You'll bleed once a month. These days, most of it is given as continuous because it means you don't have a period. Who wants to go back to having a period? There's got to be some advantages to menopause um, because I, I know I'm sounding like doom and gloom today. So with the systemic hormone therapy, um, the oral formulations can be um, a variety of different types of estrogens. Now, in North America, um, there's quite a lot of the use of Premarin or CE, uh, that should sorry be CEE, -E, not CCE, -E, conjugated equine estrogens. <clears throat> now, this is important because when I talk about the controversies with hormone therapy, it was Premarin that was used in a lot of the clinical trials looking at the effects of hormone therapy. I know a lot of you out there might be a little bit shocked to find out that Premarin comes, is distilled from pregnant, pregnant mare's urine, that's pregnant horses. And it contains many different types of estrogens, many of which are actually horse estrogens. Now you can also get uh, tablets and capsules that contain 17 beta estradiol, which is actually the same chemical structure as what comes from the ovaries. <clears throat> There's estrone, which also is a natural estrogen, but it's not very common here in North America and it's less potent than the estradiol. And you may hear of ethanol estradiol, but that's what's used mainly in the, the contraceptive pill. And it's very potent and um, generally not used for hormone therapy. So mainly you're gonna be seeing Premarin and the estradiol. When you take um, systemic hormone therapy orally, so by tablet or capsule, you swallow that capsule, it causes what's sort of like a bolus of hormones that go from the gastrointestinal tract through the blood flow from the gastrointestinal tract to the liver and then out into the circulation. And we think that a lot of the potential adverse effects of systemic oral hormones are related to the effects on the liver because it stimulates the liver to synthesize a whole lot of different chemicals and proteins that may be responsible for some of the adverse effects we see with oral formulations like increased risk of blood clots. Now you can get estrogen systemic therapy in the non-oral forms and the most common that you would hear about a patch, cream or gel. And this is usually 17 beta estradiol. So it's much more, it's the same sort of estrogen that you produce from the ovaries. So it's more physiological from that perspective and also because you're putting it on the skin, it's not coming in as a bolus, it's not going through the liver, it's not affecting liver uh, function, and it's a con continual gradual uh, absorption across the skin. So it's more physiological from that perspective. Then there's the progesterones that you have to take also, and there are different types and um, different effects of those progesterones that we have to take into consideration as well that I've listed here on this slide. So why is the decision re regarding hormone therapy so complicated? Well, when I started in this area and everyone was being told they should be on hormone therapy, the early studies 
um, were actually what we call observational or population studies, where they looked at thousands of women in the late 1980s and the early 1990s that were taking hormone therapy. And that population or observational data suggested that it reduced cardiovascular disease, so heart attacks and strokes, and deaths from um, cardiovascular disease and all causes, along with other benefits. We also had some mechanistic studies where we're looking at directly at the effects of hormone therapy that showed beneficial effects on things like cholesterol and endothelial function that I talked about earlier. But then in the late 1990s and the early 2000s, we had, um, we had a test of these hypotheses that it was beneficial for cardiovascular function with randomized controlled trials, RCTs. And these did not show a reduction in cardiovascular disease and death and actually showed a possible increase in heart attack and stroke. So what we had was the population data versus the randomized control data. Very complicated and um, swung that pendulum. So why the disparities? Very interesting question. Probably lots of reasons. Now the randomized control trials, they were done in um, using that Premarin or the CEE, so a potent oral non- um, non-human woman estrogen, which was important. Also, the women in those clinical trials tended to be well past menopause. So the average age was in their 60s. Um, in one of the studies, late 60s. So you're giving hormone therapy to women who are more than a, a decade post menopause. Um, and many of them didn't have symptoms. They didn't want women with symptoms because then how would you know, how would you stop them from knowing if they're on placebo or active ingredient? So there are a lot of problems with the, the subjects in those studies. And then with the observational studies, um, the, the studies of the population, there was also that sense that the, only the healthy women were being put on hormone therapy. So you had a healthy woman bias. Now, one of the things that we've, we've worked on over the last decade or so is looking at younger women. So if we, if we pull the data from those randomized controlled trials, and actually look at the young women, so those that are, were um, less than 60 years of age and or within 10 years of menopause, then um, we actually found that there was no adverse effects on cardiovascular health. Um, so when we pulled the data or if we did what we call subgroup analyses, where with each of those clinical trials, we pulled out the, those younger women, that's what we found. And now we've also started looking at using non-oral forms, but rather the uh, transdermal estrogen, which is more, as I've described, more physiological, uh, looking at those effects and or in younger women. And again, we're seeing less adverse effects on cardiovascular health. So it's, it's complicated. So what we know is that now, we now know it depends on the type, the dose, the route of administration, possibly how long, you're on the ther hormone therapy, and very much the individual patient. That's important. Um, so in general, we know that the transdermal estrogen has less adverse effects, uh, actually on cardiovascular disease, but other things like blood clots that can occur with hormone therapy. Um, we know that the type of progesterone may also be important. And now we recommend that you take into effect many factors if a woman is considering hormone therapy, it is not prescribed for prevention of cardiovascular disease. That's very important. But it is prescribed in certain populations who have a lot of menopausal symptoms, uh, particularly hot flushes and sweats, because really it's the most effective treatment we have for those menopausal symptoms. And we know that it's really important to incorporate this into a healthy lifestyle that can also have benefits on cardiovascular disease, which I wanna to just touch on very briefly. So the sort of uh, thought process that, that uh, your doctor may go through if you um, are contemplating hormone therapy is to look at, uh, on this um, slide, you've got 10-year risk of cardiovascular disease. So we have a whole lot of different formulas that we can use to estimate your risk. Now, if you've had a heart attack or stroke, then you're gonna be high. So unfortunately, you'll fall into the category here at the bottom of the, the little box here, the table, where you have high risk of cardiovascular disease and we know you should avoid hormone therapy. Now, if you have low or moderate risk of heart disease, 
based on these calculations, then hormone therapy is okay, but we would recommend the transdermal rather than the oral, particularly if you're in that moderate risk group. And this is an algorithm, it's rather complicated, it's divided into two slides, but again, I want to show you that, that um, you know, your, per, your personal physician would have to go through a variety of decisions with you. That's really important um, in decision about whether or not you're going to be on hormone therapy. So if you have symptoms and you're less than 60 or less than 10 years um, since menopause, you'll go down this line. If you're older, they're going to say consider other options at this stage. If you, you fit into that first criteria, they may consider hormone therapy unless you have contraindications like established heart disease, stroke, breast cancer. Uh, if you don't have those, they'll look at your cardiovascular risk. If it's high, other options. If it's acceptable, they'll look at your breast cancer risk. High, other options. Um, and if you fulfill all of those criteria and you're still going the, down the line, then they'll decide what's the best sort of hormone therapy for you. Um, now, other options, um, they're less effective on hot flushes and sweats and things, but there's a drug called gabapentin that is used for people who have contraindications. Some of the antidepressants are helpful, not because they're antidepressants so much as they actually do affect the brain function that's causing these hot flushes. Um, clonidine does have a lot of side effects. And then there's the transvaginal that I referred to that can actually help with some of those local effects of menopause. So just in the last few minutes, I'm going to talk about how having a healthy lifestyle can help you with these effects of menopause on cardiovascular health. And I want you to not just take this on board for yourself, but really spread the word. And don't be you know, lulled into being satisfied or dissatisfied with what I've been talking about with menopause and with that as a status quo. Healthy lifestyle choices really make a difference and can counteract many of the adverse effects of perimenopause and menopause. These are not motherhood statements, they're not feel-good statements. That's why we have cardiac rehab, for example, because healthy lifestyle is one of the best things you can do for your, for your health. So uh, exercise is medicine for menopause, just like it is for cardiovascular disease. So we know Again, this is why we have rehab, uh, cardiovascular rehab, reduces heart attacks and strokes and the complications of heart attacks and strokes. It decreases the risk of severity of some of the life-threatening conditions that become more of an issue after menopause, like the diabetes, high blood pressure, uh, depression, your high cholesterol. Just as an aside, exercise is the um, tonic of youth for everything, including even cancer deaths and uh, even cognition and Alzheimer's disease. And it will also reduce the disability from some of the chronic non-life-threatening uh, conditions associated with menopause, like um, osteoporosis and fracture risk. <clears throat> some of the things like poor sleep and anxiety, headaches that can come on after menopause. And importantly, it can reduce your risk of becoming frail so re and reduce the risk of falls. And some of the research I've done that I always like to just put in here is that I looked at the effects of a single bout of exercise in postmenopausal women on cardiovascular health. So I walked them on a treadmill for 45 minutes, just a brisk walk, able to hold a conversation. And I looked at, at uh, blood pressure and that, your blood vessel health. And just one walk will, for a number of hours afterwards, lower your blood pressure, improve your, your blood sugar, improve the function of your blood vessels, and we all know that it improves, improves our mood. We've all talked about this during COVID, about how this has helped people coping with the stress of COVID. So exercise is medicine and really important. And just to show you, this is just a graph that shows you blood pressure before and after exercise training in hypertensive, so women with high blood pressure post-menopause. And you can see that the lines are sloped high on the left and go down on the right. And that's actually lowering blood pressure after 12 weeks of moderate intensity treadmill training. So, and it lowered the blood pressure by about 10 millimeters of mercury, which is definitely as good as a medication. So exercise is medicine for blood pressure. Healthy diet is really important. Um, 
So the DASH diet is something that we use for hypertension. The Mediterranean diet has been shown to be beneficial for cardiovascular health. Basically, good food habits that are on the left of this slide, they're the fresh fruits, vegetables, whole grains, all the things you'd be hearing about in cardiac rehab, and low salt. The bad food habits, rather like Winnie the Pooh here, who's got that central obesity, he eats too much honey. But what we do in North America is we eat too many fast foods, um, processed foods, um, high salt content foods. Um, so healthy diet is really important for cardiovascular health, as is limiting your alcohol intake to what we recommend, which is less than a drink, less than or equal to a drink a day for women. Sleep. Um, try and practice good sleep hygiene because of the effects of menopause on sleep and the fact that we know bad sleep contributes to cardiovascular health. And that's going to sleep at a regular time every night, having um, around seven hours of sleep, et cetera. Doing all the things to make you sleep better, not getting yourself, not watching the news, the constant cycle before you go to bed. Keep yourself less stressed. And so um, fight the stress um, and the, the associated anxiety that comes with that that's worsened by perimenopause and menopause with healthy habits. So, you know, that's adaptive responses. Think about how you can be a problem solver, um, positive self-talk, relaxing, slowing down, um, laugh. Laughter is important. Talk with your family and friends and do have that healthy lifestyle that I've talked about and try and find some pl pleasure in life. Again, we've talked a lot about this during the last, how many months has it been? Um, for those of us in the hospitals, it seems like an eternity, but uh, since March at least with COVID. So make these healthy lifestyle choice, choices and think about perimenopause and menopause as a time to really take stock. You're moving out of that premenopausal period where we're protected from heart disease and strokes and we're protected from high blood pressure and poor cholesterol and diabetes and poor sleep and sleep apnea. This is, I really want to see um, women and their healthcare providers thinking early on in the perimenopausal period about how they can make sure they're living the healthiest lifestyle, taking stock. And because you're going to have another half of your life in that postmenopausal period. So it's really important that you're aware. I do think that, um, Having talks like this are important, um, but I don't want to just be talking to patients. I want patients to go out to their peers. Um, I want to talk them to talk to their mothers, wives, partners, sisters, friends, just get the word out. You know, I really feel like uh, perimenopause and menopause, well, we've sort of started talking about it in cardiovascular area, but still it's not something that people talk about openly a lot. Why not? It's a, it's a change that every woman's going to go through and we should all be aware of it and what it means for our health and make sure that we are the happiest and healthiest women that we can be and, and productive and have a really good quality of life for that second half of our life. So awareness is important and that's not just for you and, and your uh, circle or your bubble as we call them these days, uh, but also healthcare providers, Researchers, we're doing more research into this area. Um, I'm not the only one, that's for sure. I sort of was one of the few back when I started my PhD, but there's a lot of people working in this area. We have a wonderful uh, research network across Canada now that looks at heart health in women, and this is one of the subjects, and the Heart Health Alliance of all of us across Canada. So that involves researchers, and we need to get it into health policy as well. So with that, this is my contribution to myself. This is where I would have been a couple of weeks ago. Um, this, was, this is the Rocky Mountains where I was hiking uh, just a couple of years ago and I was gonna be there a couple of months ago, uh, but didn't go because of COVID. But um, I've got my arms out there because I've made it to the top and uh, we all need to, to, you know, it takes effort to change lifestyle, but we can all do it and we can do it when we buddy up with our friends and colleagues and family members and with our health providers. So, uh, thanks, uh, Lisa. I'm happy to take any questions. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Harvey.
Um, while we wait for people to type some in, if, if anybody has any, I do have a couple of questions myself. Um, I'm just wondering the effect of, or if there is an effect of a history of reproduction on, you know, your future cardiovascular health once you're in menopause. So if I have had children versus if I haven't, if there's any difference in risk for cardiovascular disease. Post-menopause. Yeah. So if you go, if you think back to that first slide where I, I talked about the reproductive life history of women, the, where we go through many different stages, each of those stages where our hormones change have impact on cardiovascular health. So um, in our early premenopausal uh, pre period, we may be on hormones for birth control. And we do know that birth control uh, medications can increase blood pressure and can increase risk of stroke. So um, that's important. And doctors need to work with patients and make sure they're checking blood pressure and making sure that they don't put women who are at increased risk of um, complications on birth control and that they're monitored. Pregnancy. Pregnancy is a stress test. It's our first cardiac stress test. So that's a time when we can have uh, cardiovascular complications during the pregnancy. And in that post-pregnancy period or the, the peripartum period, period. And in particular, if you have um, what's called gestational diabetes or gestational hypertension, so that's high blood pressure or diabetes during pregnancy, we know that that can also uh, increase, um, approximately double your risk of uh, heart disease and hypertension and diabetes in the longer term. So there's a big focus on us now trying to keep women healthy not just during pregnancy, but after pregnancy, particularly if they've had those complications. So a lot of these things I've talked about today would apply to a woman that's had gestational diabetes or hypertension. Um, then there's uh, other um, effects on hormones. So women that have um, infertility issues, they may have some um, disruption of their hormones and they may um, have increased cardiovascular risk um, related, so things like polycystic ovarian syndrome, PCOS, that affects quite a lot of women, can increase, increase the risk of hypertension and diabetes. Um, and then there are certain conditions I've been interested in women who exercise a lot and stop menstruating and they become estrogen deficient, that may impact um, their cardiovascular health. So there are a lot of things that need to be taken into consideration. Um, and when I take a cardiovascular history, I always ask about a woman's reproductive health. So whether or not she's, um, she's been pregnant and what, whether she had complications during pregnancy, um, whether she had high blood pressure, diabetes, that sort of thing, did she have fertility problems? Um, so I think it's important for family docs and cardiologists, internists, also any of your clinicians to be asking about your your reproductive history, because it's not just menopause that plays into cardiovascular health. That's great, thank you. And you sort of touched on this, but I'll maybe ask you to elaborate a little bit more. So you talked quite a bit about, you know, these healthy behaviors once you're in menopause. Um, do, do, does your activity level or your fitness level pre-menopause have a major effect on your outcomes post-menopause? or once you're in menopause, I should say? Well, I, I think um, the evidence would suggest yes. Um, it's, I would say it's never too early to begin and it's never too late to begin. Uh, because the earlier you get into healthy lifestyle, the better that's gonna be for, for your blood vessels um, and for your muscles and your, um, your overall health cardiovascular and, and otherwise. And we do know if we put somebody, as you would know, Lisa, if you put somebody on a treadmill and you look at what their, their exercise capacity is, that that has implications for their cardiovascular risk and risk of death. So even in premenopausal women, it's important. And if you have that healthy substrate going into menopause, that's all the better. If you think about that timing hypothesis, that's all about, it takes time to develop plaque and stiffness of the blood vessels. And unfortunately, we know that our blood vessels are pristine for perhaps 20 years of our life and then we start building up plaque even in our 20s and 30s and start changing the health of our blood vessels and and other um, and our uh, you know a, a number of different factors that affect cardiovascular health so we the earlier we can start the better your your baseline is 
for when you go into menopause. So I don't want to discourage women that have perhaps not been as healthy or as physically active before menopause, but I think the earlier you start, which is why I really want to focus also on peri uh, perimenopause, but also in the premenopausal period, the better it is for your baseline and where you're starting. And of course, for pregnancy, that makes a difference too. Uh, the healthier you are when you go into pregnancy, the better it is for the pregnancy outcome. So sooner the better, but never too late. Perfect. There is one question in the Q&A here, so I, I can read it out for you. If blood pressure is controlled by medication, are you still considered to have high blood pressure as a risk factor? I'm assuming if you're on the medication and so therefore it's lowering it. So you're still considered to have the risk factor, but um, by lowering your blood pressure, the you take the pressure off the blood vessels, the heart and the kidneys. And not only does that stop the progression of all the bad effects of high blood pressure on those organs, it may even reverse some of those adverse effects. So the effects on endothelial function can be reversed by treating your blood pressure. So lower your blood pressure. And a lot of our medications we take for blood pressure help with the health of the blood vessels in the heart as well that will not only stop progression, but help reverse. Um, and so it's important to try and get your blood pressure down to the target that is appropriate for you as well, to optimize the health of the, the blood vessels, the kidneys and the heart. So even though we refer to it as a, as a still having that risk factor, you've got hypertension, but it's control. And that's important because it's, if you are, have your hypertension control, your cardiovascular risk, your stroke risk, your kidney disease risk, it all comes down significantly. If your blood pressure is uncontrolled, they go up. And we do know, you know, even if you're looking at some of the stiffness of the blood vessels, for example, or as I mentioned, the endothelial function, when you control your blood pressure, the blood vessels can come lose some of that stiffness and be, become more compliant. Um, and uh, generally it, it will increase your health. And that's why um, it's so important to have your blood pressure controlled and have it checked on a yearly basis. So that, that as you go through the menopausal transition, as the blood pressure gradually increases, what it may have been a year before is not what it might be a year in advance. So keeping check on the blood pressure, making sure it's at target so that you're protecting your blood vessels, your heart, your kidneys. That's great. Well, with that, I don't see any other questions in the Q&A, so I think we'll close out this session for today. Thank you so much, Dr. Harvey. As always, a very thorough and, and great explanation. We very much appreciate you joining us today for th this, this talk. It's one that's been in high demand, so we, we very much appreciate uh, you being here with us today. So before we actually close out, I do have a couple of announcements. First things first, we are looking for feedback from people who have and have not been attending our Cardiac College Learn Online and our Women with Heart Online sessions um, that we have been having since the start of the pandemic. And so when you visit our website here, you will see on the right hand side a spot where you can click on this red button that says complete a short survey and we ask that if you don't mind to take the five minutes to go to the website and click on this link and fill out a short survey about your experiences with the cardiac college learn online and women with heart online sessions and as i said we're looking for people who have and have not been attending so that we can get feedback to make sure we're offering what it is that you are looking for so Thank you very much um, in advance for completing this short survey. Last announcement is that our next session will be Tuesday, October 13th at 10 a.m. This is going to be an exercise class and it's gonna be a cardio dance class. And so this one will not be a live exercise class. It was pre-recorded, but an exercise class nonetheless. And this was put on by Marilena Keast from the University of Ottawa Heart Institute. And so we are very excited uh, for that talk. And so with that, I will um, close out the session for today. And once again, thank you so much, Dr. Harvey, for being with us today and providing us with this very high demand talk. So have a great day, everybody, and we'll see you in two weeks.